let's kind of switch again from the one last thing that we want to talk about are PF3 kinase inhibitors. And I know you participated in Bell 3 or Bell 2. Bell the 2. Bell what do you think of Bell 3, which was presented uh, last year? I think, well, Bell 3 was either this year uh, and then we had Tocelacid presented this year. What do you think of where we're going? What do you think of those trials? Can you kind of let our audience know what they're about? Um, so, Buparlacib or BCAM. Um, 120 is a pan PI3 kinase inhibitor, so BEL2 was a clinical trial very similar to Bolero2 where patients who had received prior AI were randomized to receive um, fulvestrant versus fulvestrant plus a PI3 kinase inhibitor being buparlacib. And BEL3 uh, was even extension of that. This, these were patients who had received prior um, AIs, including AI plus mTOR, uh, and were randomized to receive fulvestrant versus fulvestrant plus the uh, PI3 kinase inhibitor or buparlacib. And the trial did show a statistically significant benefit. Patients who received fulvestrant plus PI3 kinase inhibitor had an improvement in progression-free survival as compared to fulvestrant. But if you look at the data, the control arm um, did not do very well. And that's to be expected in a, in a patient population that has received multiple prior lines of therapy, including an mTOR inhibitor, um, in that patient population, giving fulvestrant um, would not be that helpful, and the trial did show that the control arm um, did not do that well. But the addition of PI3 kinase inhibitor did, had, did have an improvement in um, progression-free survival that was clinically significant, and one could potentially argue that it was clinically meaningful as well. The challenge with PI3 kinase inhibitor um, buparlacib is the potential toxicity. Um, it does cause... Um, uh, it does cause effect on the CNS system. Um, so some patients had increase in depression, um, concern for suicide, and also LFT uh, abnormalities. Um, so there is, there is interest in PI3 kinase inhibitors that are more selective, um, like tocilisib uh, or alpilisib, which is um, uh, another drug by Novartis, which, which are pan PI3 kinase inhibitors, which are uh, alpha selective PI3 kinase inhibitors. So the idea is that you inhibit the alpha uh, component of PI3 kinase, which is what drives tumor progression, but you don't affect the other components, the beta, gamma, delta, which can contribute to the side effects. So you have a very selective. Um, PI3 kinase inhibitor that can essentially achieve the same result with lower toxicity. And it reminds us of the CDK4-6 story as well. When pan-CDK4-6 inhibitors were developed in the 2000s, they were abandoned because of toxicity. But when CDK4-6 selective inhibitors were developed, that is when we saw the success. So it's about selectivity towards the tumor while uh, lowering the side effects. So, but the, the issue is that, I mean, to sell us it, we had a phase three trial. It was apparently, in my understanding, very similar to the Bell trial, you know, to sell and placebo with a second line endocrine therapy. And there was a PFS, I think, of a month or two, two months. It was statistically significant. But really, what do you do? I mean, it sounds like if I'm a pharma, I'm probably not going to develop to sell us it, you know, based on, just like we're not going to develop BKM. I assume based on that. I mean, what do we do now? Well, you know, the BK120 studies are interesting. You know, Basalga went back and looked at activating mutations in the PI3 kinase, and that's truly what drives the difference in PFS is from patients who had self, sorry, cell-free DNA PI3 kinase mutations. You know, there's a 3.6-month absolute difference roughly in PFS for the addition of the PI3 kinase inhibitor versus where the mutation wasn't found in cell-free DNA. Those curves are like right on top of one another. So I think it's, I absolutely agree. It's like the fine tuning, which is not only do you get a more specific drug, but I think it also is gonna be, you know, what's going on in the tumor itself. And I'm really um, coming to a very optimistic place that cell-free DNA alongside with some of the other things that we're doing in the genomics world might help Big Pharma get the right drugs to the right patients. And we may come up with doing cell-free DNA assays on people at an earlier point, you know, because there seem to be a lot of kind of targeted therapies we can now potentially use and figure out the therapy.